Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. Today we've got a traditional unboxing episode. So I picked up a couple more things for my personal collection because that's what I do. The last couple of months in a year, I know what I have to spend. I worked hard, I might as well enjoy my stuff, right? So this is one that had showed up on Reverb, where it was a fair price, not a steal by any means. It was for sale by a different dealer. But I'm always looking for cool custom color Les Paul Customs from the 80s and 70s. With the caveat being that they're in very clean condition. Because as far as regular models go, the customs are my favorite. And when you can find them in a crazy color, it just makes it all the more exciting. So obviously, not the original case, but it's kind of cool anyways. Let's see what I found here. Oh my, that's very buttercreamy. So what do we got over here? It's just a white Les Paul Custom. What's so special about this, Trogly? No, it's pearl white. That means it has a little bit of a metallic sheen to it. So if you catch it in the light just right, you can see what I'm talking about. I remember when I first found Pearl Metallic, I thought I was just buying a white Les Paul Custom, but this just happened to work out. This one's a little bit more yellowed than I was hoping for, but the condition is there. And the other thing that makes this one special is the fact that we've got all the cool parts. You've got the top adjust bridge. We have the Tim Shaw PAFs. Unfortunately, we don't have the stickers on it anymore, but you've got the diamond shaped posi locks. And the awesomest feature is the flip out winding tuners. So overall, we can see a couple of seam lines on the top, which it's to be expected. There's a little bit of a rub area right here. But as far as these go, it's not in too bad a shape, but we've definitely got a little bit of finish checking on the headstock, but that's kind of to be expected on a metallic finish of Gibson's. So overall, I'd probably give this one like a solid nine. As far as the black light goes, everything's looking okay here. Just the things I knew about. I actually had like a really clean one of these at one point in time that had it in all age. I kind of regret selling that one now that I want one for my own personal collection, but this one will do okay. And I'm sure I've got an error correct case for it somewhere. So there we go, beautiful pearl white. All right, what is next here? Let's take a look. This is one I'm a little bit worried about because it came from Canada and it was not packed well in the slightest. There's no padding on the inside, so it's just flopping about. Kind of worried about this one because it's another one from my personal collection that's really hard to find and replace. But it popped up on Reverb one night and it's like, yes, finally, one has shown up. There's only 25 of them. Okay, I see what happened. He had this to secure the case, but it wasn't a tight of enough fit, so it just made it feel like there was nothing. There was an effort made to secure it, but he just needed a little bit more padding. But sometimes I take that for granted. I have like a million shipping boxes in my house and like way more packing materials than I could ever need. As long as it arrives safely, I don't make a fuss out of anything. Inside here, I'm hoping it's the condition I think it is in. Cobra number 21. Obviously, that's not original, but... Oh, nice. That's a good one. That's a nice one. So I've already documented the Cobra Burst. You can check it out in this episode, but it's a brother model to the Black Widow. They were Sam Ash exclusives and the Widow was all red and looked great. Whereas the Cobra is a little bit more obscure. However, this is where the Cobra Burst finish started. So if you ever see a Cobra on anything else, it is because of this model. And I really love animal influenced ones. So it's got a silver stinger back here with a very vicious looking Cobra. And normally I'm all about happy, nice things, but this is just such a sweet guitar. And to find one in good shape has been tough. I mean, to find one in general is tough, but that one, yep, I think I found myself a keeper here. But I think my last Cobra Burst had a big ding on the neck right here, and that's why I didn't keep that one. This one's got a small one. And we've got some finish checking by the tuners again, but again, it's a metallic finish. That's to be expected. That's a keeper. Let me know if anybody's selling the Black Widow in clean condition. I don't care if this has any future value with anybody else. I think they're awesome, and I love animal-influenced guitars, so that is a welcome addition here. But these are kind of cool because they're really, like, build after an R7 gold top. So even though they look like customs, they're built more so like chambered standards of 57. Again, check that video out for more detailed info. Continuing on here, my friends, this is part of my forwarding service. There's a guy overseas who's really picky and particular with wood grain. He has bought like five of this model and he's like sending them back going, no, nah, no, nah, it's not beautiful. It's not beautiful enough. 
So he found one for sale in the United States that meets his standard, and they don't ship internationally. So he knows that I offer my international forwarding service for a fee, of course. So even though after import duties and taxes and all that other good stuff, he ended up having to pay like double for this. I, I hope it's worth it, man, because this is one of the new Fender guitars. We're actually going to see a review of one of those very shortly because somebody had new guitar they purchased the Tele version. The foreshadowing aside, uh, that's a pretty big case. It's probably not a Telecaster. Inside here is that quirky little bass. So it's a pretty cool P bass, but he liked the wood grain on this particular one because it almost has a book matching like characteristic to it. I mean, maybe not an exact match, but this is one of the nice examples of here. But first impressions on this, I really like the aged lacquered neck. It gives it some vintage vibes, which obviously is what Fender is going for here. But oh, I do like that back. That's pretty cool. But oh my, stock from the factory, this actually comes with flat wounds. That's interesting. That's a cool little touch that I didn't know to expect on this. Check out the cool bridge saddles too. Looks like they're made out of wood, that's cool. I'm not really that much of an aficionado on Fender bases. Also kind of looks like pepperoni sticks. Now our last guitar to feature for today before we get to an accessory. I, I kind of forget what's in this box, I forgot to label it. Ah, oh, now there I see it, it's labeled P90, okay. So there was once a guitar hunt that I was on that fortunately I had actually completed. However, like I taught you in my guitar hunting tips from a pro episode, you know, my videos act as a, hey, are you selling this guitar? You, you can contact me and maybe I'll be interested because I was looking for one of these in a P90 variation. Now, this case makes you think it might be a 70s thing, but it's not. It's actually from the 90s. But inside here sleeps another one of these bad boys. And oof, it's a little bit more beat up than I was expecting. But the color is great. It's the Gibson Les Paul DC Pro. Doesn't look much like a Les Paul, but it's a double cutaway version. There were very few of these made in the beautiful indigo blue finish with the P90 pickups and the wrap tail. Now, unfortunately, this one kind of got jostled around in shipping. Our uh, toggle switch here has fallen in because this just completely came loose. So I'll be able to fix that. We've got some pretty deep scratches in this area and a few nicks and dings. So I think overall, this will probably just be catch and release for me, but the fretboard's really clean on this one. It's got a little bit of the shrinkage and somebody has played with our tuners. So in retrospect, I I'm glad I didn't pay too much more than I did for this one, but it's nice to see another one come out into the wild because these are just a lot of fun. So you can message me on my website. Honestly, guys, I'm a little bit behind on listing things. So if you're interested in something that you see, most times I sell it unless I say, you know, it's personal collection type stuff. If you want personal collection stuff from me, I mean, you have to pay like two to three times market value because I have no incentive to sell it otherwise. So overall, I'd say I'm happy with this purchase. No hard feelings there. But lastly here, we have something kind of fun that I'm buying strictly kind of for the museum in our unboxing series here. There is a seller on Reverb who kind of irks me, like not in a I hate you way, in like a, ah, you, why are you always teasing us? So he has this really cool vintage 70s Gibson sign that he puts in any model that was birthed in that era. So for example, if he's selling a 1979 The Paul, he'll put this up in the case to make it look special, make you click thinking, okay, that's included and it's not. So that's kind of a, a different dilemma. Should you really put things in the photo that are not included? I think something like a guitar stand, okay. Most people understand that's not included, but when you start flaunting around vintage signs, man, that's no fair. So imagine my surprise when one of those signs show up on eBay. It was initially an auction, and me being an old man, I was taking a nap when it ended and I missed it. So I messaged him, hey, if that top bidder doesn't pay, which is very common on eBay, you let me know, cause I'm interested. And then he said, you know, I've actually got another one. The cardboard's not as in good of condition, but I'll sell it to you for the same price. I don't know, you tell me, was paying a thousand dollars for this worth it? It's a beautiful Masonite little board. It's the Norland era logo, which is exactly what I talk about all the time. I didn't realize it was actually glued to the cardboard. And okay, it appears to be stapled onto the cardboard. But it's supposed to set up like that. I thought that looked nice. But this was like supposed to set on a counter to advertise that you sell Gibsons and their stuff. So new old stock from the 70s. I mean, I think I paid a bit too much, but it's cool. It's really cool. But all right, that's going to end it for tonight's episode. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.